Hi, yeah. Hi. Thank you. Um, I really hope I'm a fast metabolizer because I've had about six cups of coffee today. Um, I'd like to thank um, Gunild for inviting me and the Eat Forum team who've done a fantastic job. Um, my, my presentation, I was asked by Gunild to, my exam question was, tell us about inequalities in the food system. So it's quite a shift from the two, fa three fabulous presentations we've already heard. I could have spent a lot of time talking to you about all the terrible and disastrous and really troubling data that a number of people have presented so far in terms of outcomes, the billions, the hundreds of millions. I'm not going to do that. Like one of the previous speakers said, uh, the future is here and it's not evenly distributed. Well, malnutrition is here and it's not evenly distributed. But it's not evenly distributed because of inequalities within the food system. And that's really what I want to talk to you about today. So the three, the three inequalities I want to talk about are the way we create the demand for healthy diets, the affordability of healthy diets, and the environments that undermine healthy diets. So the first inequality is the approaches um, used to influence the demand for food. So whether you live in a, or whether you uh, hang out on a fancy golf course or in the shanty town right next door to it, the way in which the public sector tries to influence the way you uh, consume food and what's healthy food is really stuck in the 19th century, it seems to me. Um, here's a, a, a highly scientific diagram of the brain. Uh, left brain, right brain. Left brain is, uh, I'm a bit left brain, you know, logical, linear, um, data. And this is, the, this is the approach that most behavior change programs in the public sector utilize. Not all of them, but most of them. And I've got two adolescents at home and I can't get them to eat things that are healthy for them. They just look at me and roll their eyes when I say, this is good for you, you really should eat. All the evidence shows you this is good. They roll their eyes. Really, what they're interested in is the right brain stuff. All the, the deliciousness, the, the, the cravings, the uh, imagery, the aspiration. Uh, that's what they're really interested in. And of course, consumer advertising campaigns are absolutely brilliant at doing this. So at my organization, the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, we are pioneering hybrid combinations of these two approaches. How can we combine the best of the left brain and the right brain? And we're doing this with adolescents because I think as one of the previous speakers said, they are the ones who have the most agency. They're going to be setting the norms if they're not already doing so. They're the ones we should be looking to to say, this is, this is what a healthy diet is. Inequality number two is, so that was demand, this is more about availability and, and access and affordability. Who can afford a healthy diet? So there was a great study um, published in Lancet Global Health last year, towards the end of last year, and it was a, a group of scientists, um, the Pure study, some of you may know it, and they said, in Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, and Zimbabwe, we've got some national level data. We're going to ask a very basic question. Now, you and I in the audience, we can all afford to, uh, to purchase 20 fruits and vegetables a day, right? We probably don't do it, but we could afford to do it. They said, what percentage of household income would a household need to spend to get five fruits and vegetables a day? And the astonishing figure is 52%. So if I'm a household, a typical household in those countries, and I want to buy five fruits and vegetables a day, I've got to use 52% of my income to do it. It's not going to happen. Most people just can't afford to buy healthy foods. So we work a lot in uh, Africa and South Asia, and we work a lot with, with SMEs. Um, and many SMEs are not worried about triple bottom line, they're just worried about profits. But they happen to be working in sectors or on, with commodities and products that are inherently healthy. So we work with them to build their capacity business, around business and around nutrition, to, to scale up, to be more profitable, to lower the price points of their work. So I was visiting one of them in Mozambique, these are one of our marketplace grantees, and I said to the managing director, what's this picture on your wall? And he said, that's our mission statement. I said, explain. He said, the top, num the top word is price. We want to get the price from there down to here. Okay, what's that triangle? The triangle is the pyramid. And we want to get to consumers at the bottom of the pyramid, the one, two, three, four dollar a day folks. So they're not doing it because they think nutrition is so wonderful. They're doing it because they want to make profit. And they happen to be, this was a peanut butter manufacturer. They happen to be working on, on something that is inherently good and part of a healthy diet. The third inequality I want to talk about 
is the asymmetry of information about business and nutrition. And I'm talking about businesses so much because, as Anna Lati said yesterday, healthy diets have to have healthy food systems behind them, and healthy food systems are made up of businesses, right? Businesses are the primary stakeholders in, in food systems. You can't have one without them. However, because there's very little evidence, very little um, documented independent evidence about when, how, how why, and who um, governments and businesses should interact with to actually advance nutrition status, we're kind of in this, uh, I like to call it this kind of, it's, it's too ideologically driven. The worlds of business and nutrition are, they may not seem to be at loggerheads here, but in many fora I go to, they are. And it's kind of this, you, you're, a, you're a world traveler, as you've seen these uh, UBS uh, ads. Hopefully I won't, get, uh, I won't get lawyers on me for this. But you, you've seen they have the same picture, but, but with three different labels attached to them. And the three different labels are all about how you see the world. And I feel like that's where we are with business and nutrition. Um, certainly in parts of Africa and Asia, there's a, there's a group of people who think business can do no wrong. They're smarter, they've got more resources, they're more efficient. There's a group of people who think business has no business in nutrition, and they're out there, and you've met them, and they're powerful. They're, they're noisy, but they're influential. They're small, noisy, and influential. Most people are in the middle, I think. I am. I certainly am. Uh, I'm convinced business has to be part of the uh, solution. But when, how, who, with what products, with what groups? And so we are working to build the enabling environment for productive engagement. And the first rule is engage. Uh, there's an African proverb that says, if you want to change somebody's head, they've got to be in the room. Uh, so first thing is engage. Don't champion business but champion engagement with business. Uh, you have to practice due diligence, you have to generate evidence, you have to ge and you have to share that evidence. How many panels have I been on with business leaders and they've said, we're doing this fantastic thing on nutrition. It's great. I say, that sounds great, and it really does sound great. Show me, wh where can I find out more? Go to the website, so go to the website faithfully, and I find more often than not, sort of a bit of PR fluff on the website, there's no independent evidence, uh, there's no evaluation, and yes, we, want, we care about profits, planet, and people, but profits is much easier to demonstrate than impacts on people and the planet. And this is my final slide. So we come to the question of how much food is needed to feed the world in 2030. So both of these types of foods can actually feed the world in 2030, but of course that is the wrong question. The right question is what needs to happen to nourish the world and now. And I would argue, and my organization would argue, that we need new ways to create demand for healthy diets, new ways to support businesses, especially the small and medium ones that get to the most vulnerable, to meet that demand, and we need new ways for governments to create the environment to enable it. This is what we work on at GAIN, and I welcome you to come and join us. Thank you very much.